uh, before we get started, uh, so take a look at uh, the, the link that's given at the top right. Uh, so I'll just read it aloud as well. It's aif360.mindfulness.net slash community. Uh, that will give you uh, a link to join a Slack community uh, for the open source project. And we've created a specific channel called uh, FAT Tutorial 2019. Uh, within uh, that Slack community, it's specifically for uh, this tutorial here. And pinned at the top are the uh, files that you need to fully uh, participate in the, uh, in the tutorial parts. So, um, given that uh, we're experiencing some uh, limited bandwidth, I would encourage uh, all of you to, uh, to start downloading stuff and installing as well. Um, if uh, if you can, um, we will have a section coming up uh, towards the end of the first half, uh, which will uh, go through all the installation instructions in detail. But uh, if you feel comfortable and, uh, and okay with it, then just go ahead and, and follow the uh, installation guide that's uh, pinned at the top of the desktop channel. Uh, we also have a few of our team members uh, sitting in our town uh, right now who are monitoring the Slack channel as well. So, uh, they can help answer any installation questions, and uh, uh, Parthi, Mike, Rachel, and I are also available for any So before uh, we get going, any problems with anyone accessing this uh, URL and joining the Slack community? Uh, anyone successfully being able to do that, if you can raise your hand? Uh, yeah, okay, very good. Awesome. And you're able to find the specific channel in there as well, is that right? Yeah, yeah. okay. Very good. Um, okay, so um, another set of URLs just to be aware of. Uh, we'll get to these uh, as we go along, but um, the URLs at the bottom of uh, the screen, so aif360.lumis.net is the main website for the project. Um, the actual code lives on GitHub, uh, this URL, github.com slash ibm slash aif360. Uh, for folks who were part of the previous tutorial, um, you're aware of uh, pip installation, and uh, there is a pip version of uh, AI 360 as well. All right, so um, I'm assuming that most of the folks who are attending uh, have some idea about fairness and so forth, but uh, just to get us warmed up, I uh, just wanted to say a few words, okay? So, as we're all realizing, uh, AI is now used in many high-stakes decision-making applications. Uh, so that ranges from credit, uh, employment, uh, college admissions, uh, prison sentencing, and, and so forth. Okay. Um, and in particular, if you're interested, the second picture is where all of us are kind of what's our right. um, So when you are using these uh, algorithms and uh, decision support tools, um, what does it take to trust them, uh, trust those decisions made by machines? And really, what is it beyond uh, just predictive accuracy? So if, even if you achieve 99% accuracy, um, there's still more that you would like to see. So that includes fairness, um, it includes uh, explainability, it includes robustness to adversarial attacks, robustness to data set shifts, it includes uh, intent transparency. Um, so in particular, um, we'll focus on fairness here. Um, and if you go to, um, to that first uh, URL, the ai360.mindwomens.net, you'll see that there's a resources section and it includes a glossary. Um, just to make sure that all of us are on the same page, um, I'll quickly go through that glossary uh, with you guys as well. Um, on the website, it's uh, sorted alphabetically. Um, here, I'll do it more in a logical sense, because um, otherwise I'd be jumping around. All right, so let's uh, just go through this quickly, and um, this is very much uh, intended to be something of use to you guys, so at any point, please raise your hand and uh, we'll stop and discuss. All right, so uh, when we talk about uh, these topics, uh, so a label is a value corresponding to an outcome, so that could be a hiring decision, it could be a, a pre-trial detention decision, uh, sort of thing. So, um, the label would be, did the person get approved for the loan or uh, did they get rejected for the loan? Um, among labels, there's favorable ones and unfavorable ones. 
So a favorable one is the one that um, corresponds to an outcome that provides some advantage to the recipient. So in the loan, it would be uh, receiving the loan is favorable, uh, getting rejected is unfavorable. Uh, features or attributes containing information for predicting the label. So these could be in a loan sort of setting, um, all sorts of information about you uh, as the applicant, so your credit history, your, uh, your balance, um, stuff of that nature. Um, a model is a function, um, a mathematical function that takes features as input and predicts labels as output. And in particular, a classifier is a model that predicts categorical labels from features, so um, a discrete set. So uh, the one for the one has two values um, as a discrete set, so that would be uh, the classifier model. A score is a continuous valued output um, from a classifier, which um, you would then threshold to determine what a predicted label is. Uh, machine learning, uh, the general field, is an approach for determining models from data, from, uh, specifically from training data. So training data is a data set from which uh, the model is learned. Um, now moving more specifically to fairness uh, sort of things. So a protected attribute um, is an attribute that partitions the population into groups um, whose outcomes should have some sort of uh, sameness or parity or equality. Um, so uh, these are uh, things like race, gender, religion, caste, and so forth. Um, they are usually uh, only specifiable if you have some knowledge about the, the subject matter that you're looking at. They're not any like, mathematical sort of thing. You have to really understand what's going on and then as a person define uh, what a protected attribute is. Um, and then a privileged protected attribute um, is the value of that protected attribute, um, indicating the group or groups that have historically been at systematic advantage. So uh, looking at race in the US, for example, the privileged group might be uh, white Americans, and the unprivileged group might be uh, black Americans. Um, when we talk about fairness, uh, group fairness, uh, so it's the goal of groups defined by these protected attributes to receive similar treatments or outcomes. Um, and then individual fairness is the goal of similar individuals receiving similar treatments. So this doesn't depend on the, the group membership necessarily. Um, and then when we talk about bias, that's a systematic error. Um, it has many technical definitions. Um, but it also has, is gaining popularity and uh, I mean, broader usage um, in non-statistical sort of meanings, but applied in more statistical sort of uh, settings. So uh, in the context of fairness, what we're talking about when we say bias is unwanted bias and uh, specifically. So it's any sort of bias that uh, places certain groups of so privileged groups at advantage and uh, unprivileged groups at disadvantage. Uh, fairness metric is a quantification of that unwanted bias in training data or in models. And an explainer is a functionality for providing details or um, kind of causes for why those fairness metrics are what they are. Um, the last uh, set of uh, glossary items uh, are related to the algorithms for mitigating bias. So transformer is in general a procedure that modifies a data set. A uh, bias mitigation algorithm is an uh, example of a transformer. So it's a procedure for reducing unwanted bias in training data or models. And there's three general categories of both bias mitigation algorithms. And we'll go into this a little bit more uh, as we go on. So there's pre-processing, in-processing, and post-processing algorithms. And they're differentiated by at which point in a machine learning pipeline that they are applied. So pre-processing is applied to training data, uh, and processing is applied to the learning algorithm itself, and post-processing is applied to outcome predictions. And finally, an instance weight is a numerical value that uh, is used to multiply the contribution of the uh, data point in the model. So now, uh, hopefully, uh, this was not, uh, I mean, uh, anything newsworthy, but I uh, just wanted to set the, the, the baseline. Right, so um, just a bit more on unwanted bias. So uh, machine learning in general is meant to discriminate. Uh, that is the <coughs> point in some sense. Uh, it's to um, figure out patterns that um, help differentiate different sorts of people. 
or different options. And uh, it becomes objectionable when it places certain privileged groups at advantage and certain non-privileged groups at uh, disadvantage and becomes illegal in certain contexts. And where does it come from? Uh, so the main sources are from the training data. Um, so this could be because of prejudice in the labels. So if the historical decisions that were made by humans are uh, used to, uh, to train a machine learning model, then if those contained any sort of uh, implicit or explicit bias, then uh, there will be uh, that sort of prejudice that gets uh, replicated in, in the models. Um, but also undersampling or oversampling can come to this as well. If certain groups are more or less represented in data. Uh, many of you have probably seen this graphic from uh, Moritz Hart's course uh, at UC Berkeley. Um, so, uh, fairness in machine learning is a really uh, growing topic. Uh, I think the 2018 uh, bar will probably extend off the screen here. Um, and uh, now that we're here in 2019, uh, a couple of days ago, we already had the AIES conference in Hawaii, which I actually was at the last night to here. Um, so there are a bunch of fairness papers there. There's a huge number of papers here as well. Um, last year at the FASTAR conference, uh, Arvind Narayanan um, gave a tutorial, uh, uh, which was entitled 21 Definitions of Fairness in Their Politics. Um, and uh, I mean, this is just an important thing to note, which is that uh, fairness is not one thing, uh, even if you restrict uh, the setting. Uh, um, so when we talk about fairness metrics, um, in particular group fairness metrics, um, just to give a very small preview of, uh, of this sort of thing, um, let's think about uh, a couple of situations, okay? So if we have uh, two groups, uh, as we talked about before, we have an unprivileged group and a privileged group. Um, so these are the two groups, and uh, uh, this is a legend uh, kind of describing the, the situation. So we have uh, certain people given uh, positive uh, predictions, some people given negative predictions, um, and of those, some are uh, correct and some are incorrect, uh, correct and incorrect. Um, so if we're in this particular situation where the unprivileged group and the privileged group are essentially the same, uh, we might consider that to be a fair situation. Um, but then if we're in a different situation, um, let's say this one, uh, now what we see is the privileged group um, actually has one fewer um, false uh, negative and one greater true uh, positive. We might think that this is more of an unfair situation than the previous situation. And how would we say that this is, uh, un I mean, more unfair? Right? So uh, we would need some sort of quantification of it. Uh, so one example of a fairness metric is disparate impact. Uh, so in particular, what we compare is the uh, the selection rate. So count up how many positives out of the total um, in each group uh, receive the favorable outcome and compare those across the two groups um, as a ratio uh, we've talked about is pretty tough. So in this particular case, it turns out that the value is 0.86. Um, so there's work, um, there's uh, precedent that says maybe there's some threshold that uh, is around 0.8 that would be considered as, uh, as unfair. Uh, but uh, as we've talked to uh, lots of practitioners in the field um, who are uh, kind of helping different corporations uh, defend themselves against discrimination suits and so forth. They tell us that that four-fifths rule is kind of a rule of thumb. I mean, it is looked at, but uh, we need a lot more context uh, if you're getting prosecuted and so forth. So these numbers do play a role, but they're not the, uh, the end of the story. Um, a different fairness metric is statistical parity difference. Uh, the inputs are the same, so you're looking at the selection rate. Um, you still are calculating um, those selection rates for the two groups, but now you look at the difference rather than the ratio and get a value of minus 10%. And a third one, um, which is uh, a bit different, is equal opportunity difference. Here you're comparing the true positive rate of the model versus uh, for the two groups. So uh, you have to actually look at the, uh, the accuracy, not just the selection rate. Uh, so in particular, we have 
uh, five sevenths for one group, six sevenths for the other group, uh, has a difference. This is uh, minus 15 percent. And you might ask, uh, why is it that um, we're getting negative numbers? Um, we've actually adopted a convention in the uh, AI Fairness 360 toolkit where negative means, uh, or a value less than one for a ratio metric, means uh, that the, uh, the unprivileged group is uh, at a disadvantage. Okay, so um, with these 21 definitions of fairness, why are there so many? Um, so part of it is because uh, there are many different contexts. Um, there is no, I mean, one definition that is truly applicable uh, across all uh, contexts. Um, and uh, it's been pointed out multiple times recently that uh, some of these definitions even conflict. Uh, they can't be achieved perfectly, uh, except in very uh, special edge cases. Um, so it really does require a comprehensive set of fairness metrics, as well as bias mitigation algorithms. Uh, so this is part of the reason why we named the toolkit uh, 360. So it's meant to evoke uh, comprehensiveness um, in terms of uh, all degrees of, uh, of concern. Okay? Um, and it also requires some guidance to industry practitioners, which we'll go through. Um, so in the previous tutorial, I think there was a couple of questions on uh, when should I use what, uh, if I need to uh, satisfy my customer or whatever, um, where should I go, what should I do? So uh, we'll spend some time during these next uh, uh, three hours talking about that as well. Um, and just to point out that uh, bias mitigation, um, why it's uh, a difficult problem, um, it's because of correlations between protected attributes uh, and outcome variables and features. So um, even if you drop uh, protected attributes from your data set, there's correlations to the features, so you can reconstruct um, the, the knowledge or the information that's in those protected attributes using other features. So it's not just uh, a simple uh, kind of just drop those and, and you're good. But, um, the pictures, uh, just to evoke this, um, so this is justice, which is not blind, so you can kind of peek into the other features and then see the protected attributes. Um, this is a map of Brooklyn, New York, um, which shows a practice called redlining from, uh, from some decades ago, where uh, for malicious intent, intent um, uh, banks and others would um, actually discriminate against certain groups, uh, African Americans, by not using race directly, but using other variables that were correlated, so things like so forth. Um, so this is a graphic from a paper by uh, Brian D'Alessandro um, et al. Uh, from 2017. It's an overall end-to-end -end, uh, uh, machine learning pipeline and it uh, point out, points out where um, it is that we can uh, look at fairness. So um, there's metrics and tests for um, bias and discrimination in the training data in the models. Um, and there's uh, techniques uh, for pre-processing uh, and processing and so different points at which you can uh, do this sort of stuff. And uh, again, there was a question at the uh, end of the, the previous of um, how do the different uh, options or things that are already in the open source kind of compare to each other? Um, so this is the set of um, uh, open source fairness related packages that we're aware of. Um, the second one on the list is uh, the fairness comparisons which, uh, which Carlos and uh, Sir Alan Sirish are uh, working on and talked about. Okay. Um, so all of them, uh, many of them uh, actually are only uh, for bias metrics. Uh, they're not for um, uh, bias mitigation algorithms. Really the fairness comparison is the one that has the most uh, uh, bias mitigation algorithms, uh, and uh, because of the lack of uh, the, the mitigation algorithms, we feel that, uh, as Carlos said as well, there is a need to um, really put something out there where people can, can try things both on the metric side and on the uh, mitigation side. Um, some of these uh, don't have favorable um, licenses, so equities, for example, um, cannot be used for commercial use. Um, and uh, there's, I mean, different sort of considerations. Uh, we felt that there really was a need um, for, for doing something, you know, uh, kind of say what uh, the differentiators are in a second. So 
specifically, um, what we felt was that uh, if you are targeting uh, practicing data scientists who want to incorporate uh, any sort of fairness um, checking or remediation into their natural workflows, um, we didn't feel that there was uh, anything that would um, kind of let that happen in a natural sort of way. And, uh, the typical way uh, practicing data scientists these days uh, do machine learning and uh, stuff like that is through scikit-learn, um, which is a very popular open source package. Um, so we wanted to make sure that the, the programming paradigm uh, reflects uh, the things that the practicing data scientists are already quite used, uh, quite used to. Um, so specifically, uh, this thing that we're calling AI Fairness 360, um, it includes uh, Data sets, a toolbox with um, 30 plus fairness metrics, um, ways to do fairness metric explanations, and uh, bias mitigation algorithms. Uh, so there's nine plus, so it's not that I don't know how to count. Um, the reason we say it this way is because um, in our initial release, uh, we've uh, implemented nine algorithms, but now um, since then, there have been submissions, uh, in particular one of the papers being presented here, I think tomorrow, um, from a group at uh, uh, EPFL, uh, so as well. um, they actually worked with us to implement their algorithm and put it in, so now there's 10, and we're uh, working with some other folks to, to put their algorithms in as well. Um, we do include guidance on what to use when, um, more as a document uh, rather than as any sort of active tool, but we're, uh, one of our research directions going forward is to try to see what more we can do on um, helping people with the impact of choice, what is the right, uh, from, uh, right approach for their problem. Uh, importantly, we have several industry-specific tutorials um, that are all accessible um, through the, the first URL of the AI360.mindalist.net. Um, we'll go through three of them in detail uh, in the remainder of the session. There's notebooks um, as well for, for other sort of problems. Um, the differentiation that we see, um, we do think that this is the most comprehensive uh, bias mitigation toolbox that exists. Um, we actually used a couple of implementations that were in the fairness comparisons to, um, to, you know, to see this, and we implemented a few others ourselves, um, and we took a, a few that were also available. Um, uh, so several of those metrics and algorithms have no available implementation elsewhere. Um, we have really designed this uh, with extensibility as a goal, um, which is kind of evidenced by the fact that um, the FL group was able to, uh, to put their stuff in very quickly. Um, and really it is designed to translate new research from all of you guys, uh, from all of our labs to practicing uh, industry folks. So, so that's the, the approach we've taken. Um, so we already saw this uh, figure, but uh, just to uh, translate uh, it into our terminologies, so we have data set metrics, pre-processing algorithms, and processing algorithms, post-processing algorithms, and classifier metrics. Okay. And um, in terms of the fairness metrics, the stuff that's in there so far, um, so we have various uh, selection rate based group fairness metrics, so these were the disparate impact and statistical parity different sort of ones. We have various confusion matrix-based group fairness metrics. Um, so uh, when there's different sorts of um, sort of errors that you can uh, compute, you can look at differences or ratios of those across groups. Uh, we have some uh, sample distortion metrics uh, that are more relevant for individual fairness. Um, we have consistency, which is uh, proposed in the learning fair representation paper by Zemel et al., um, which is an individual fairness metric, and we have a set of generalized entropy indices which were proposed by uh, Spiker et al. at KDD this past year. So these are a combination of individual and group fairness metric um, as a unified sort of quantity. It takes inspiration from uh, the economics of wealth distributions, so um, things that you might have heard before, uh, the Gini index, for example. This is a variation on that, which is similar. Uh, favorable mechanical properties. Um, so the list of 10 so far of the bias mitigation algorithms, um, I'm not going to read through them, but um, they are many of the ones that uh, are quite popular um, to be used as, uh, as benchmarks or as um, kind of uh, recent progress. Um, 
uh, I'll just point out that the first one uh, was our own work, so Karthi and I are co-authors on the first one. Um, but uh, really, we've tried to be comprehensive on this, so um, we're not trying to be favorable or um, kind of anything like that. So uh, really, things from around the world, from uh, Saudi Arabia, from Japan, from uh, industry and uh, academia and everything. So um, really, there are, um, there are algorithms from and one thing that uh, we do um, think is important as we've been talking with uh, various uh, clients and customers of IBM is uh, uh, the question of explanation. So explaining why it is that a particular metric uh, is as it is. Um, so we have uh, the class structure for um, uh, classifier metric explainers and uh, data set metric explainers. And Later on in the session, we'll go into more detail about what we mean by that. Um, so in terms of the toolkit structure, um, this is a diagram that Sam Hoffman and our team put together. Um, it really kind of describes uh, the, the flow of what happens uh, as you're doing uh, working with the toolkit. So you're starting off with raw data. Um, you can do pre-processing and loading. And then with the original data set, um, you can do various transformations um, so you can do um, the fair pre-processing sort of approaches to get a transformed data set. You can not do that. You can directly learn a uh, classifier that has some extra uh, fairness regularization or so forth. Or you can um, uh, do a regular classifier and then do post-processing on those. And then at any point, um, you can get uh, to a, um, a transformed data set or a uh, fair predicted data set. Yeah. How will you keep track of the uh, performance? Yeah, um, so we don't have it yet, um, but it's something that we're working on. So um, actually Sam, the person I mentioned before, um, he is developing some tools which um, you, are based on kind of decorators um, for Python, which uh, let you capture um, transformations as they're going along. And uh, our proposal is that uh, you might want to post those onto uh, immutable ledger, um, some sort of blockchain type of solution, which um, will let you uh, keep track of that provenance. Uh, we have a write-up about it. Uh, we do have somewhat of an implementation, but that write-up is having a bit of trouble getting accepted anywhere. But um, uh, we can talk more about that later. Um, in terms of the, uh, the logical structure of the, um, the classes that are part of the toolkit, um, so we have four main uh, classes. So there's data sets, there's data set metrics, there's uh, transformers, and there's explainers. Um, so specifically um, with the data sets, uh, as I mentioned before when we were doing the glossary, um, you actually need to keep uh, additional sort of information along with uh, with the, the raw data. So you need to have the privileged protected attribute, um, the, the, uh, which label is the favorable label, and so forth. So it's just a, a bit of an extension beyond what uh, a normal data frame would have, um, just to make sure that we keep all that information. Um, and then we can uh, extend that class into um, uh, other ones that have a bit more information. So if it's a binary labeled data set, for example, it would have um, uh, the favorable label as well. Um, and specifically um, on the metrics, uh, we've broken them down into um, the sample distortion metrics, the classification metrics, the, the data set metrics, and so forth. Uh, all of the bias mitigation algorithms fit into the transformer class in various places. And uh, that lets us do this uh, fit predict sort of paradigm that uh, the data scientists are used to. Um, Rachel will go through this in detail later, but uh, on the website we have an interactive demo um, which lets non-experts uh, and non-coders actually get to um, working with these tools as well. Um, so you can kind of select data sets, um, uh, run these metrics, run the vice mitigation algorithms all in an interactive uh, web experience. Uh, so you'll see that for, uh, with Rachel next. Um, and we, as I mentioned before, on this website we have a bunch of information, uh, including videos um, describing it, uh, a paper that you know, kind of um, describes things as well. Um, we have these three um, industry tutorials that we'll go through in detail here, and uh, much other stuff. So. Rachel.
Great. So as I mentioned, this really is an open source project. Uh, we don't want it to be known as an IBM thing. Uh, so one of the reasons why we're here is to encourage all of you to start contributing as well. Uh, there are, um, in addition to the EPFL submission that's already there, um, a few different things that we're working on uh, with the authors to, to get in very soon. Um, so again, I'm not going to read them, but uh, one of them, uh, the actionable recourse, is being presented here uh, at the tomorrow or Thursday. Uh, so, I mean, any of you guys, if you have your own uh, fairness algorithms, uh, please talk to us. And, um, we're going to allot some time right at the end of the three hours to have further discussion on contributing this point. Um, one thing to mention, um, there's also an active fork, um, which is terminology that if you're not used to, um, so on GitHub, for example, you can take existing code and, and fork it to um, add your own capabilities and so forth. This one, um, the, the person doing it is uh, trying to make it even more um, connected with scikit-learn. So um, there's a little bit of a gap using um, what already exists. So the paradigm is the same, but uh, there's some specific technical um, issues why it can't fully be compatible. So this guy is uh, making it fully compatible. Um, so I guess he chose the name AI360Learn to, to kind of go along with Scikit-Learn. Um, so I would encourage you to take a look at that as well. Um, and you might be wondering, are people actually using this? Um, so uh, we put it out in September, uh, late September, and so it's been around a few months, not too long, but we get, um, we've been getting a lot of questions from folks, uh, a lot of potential users. Um, one that I just wanted to highlight, uh, given that we're in Atlanta and uh, the Super Bowl is on Sunday, um, so a practicing data scientist at IBM has, used, has already used it for um, the fantasy football predictions that are offered. Um, on um, Yahoo, or sorry, on ESPN. Um, and the problem that he was facing is that um, the New England Patriots uh, receive a lot of uh, favorable news coverage, um, and the models that, uh, that, are, that are built to um, predict fantasy football stats actually use uh, sentiment and use um, as input features. So what he wanted to test and then remediate is that um, certain teams receiving more favorable news coverage might bias the, uh, the predictions. So in the working um, code of the uh, ESPN fantasy football with Watson, it is using the AI 360. Um, but there's more serious uses that we're aware of as well, but I uh, just wanted to point that one out. Yeah. Do you have comments on how, how is that working? Yeah, um, so we're kind of still learning exactly because uh, he implemented it later in the season. So um, I think next season is when we'll really get to see um, how well it um, actually uh, did. But uh, yeah, again, if you're interested, I can put you in touch with the actual data scientist. Um, so one comment to make uh, before we move on is uh, what is this toolkit appropriate for and what is it not appropriate for? Um, so specifically, um, as we all know and we'll be hearing over the next two days, um, uh, fairness is a multifaceted, uh, sort of context-dependent uh, social construct, and it defies simple definition. So the metrics and algorithms that we have in here clearly don't capture the full scope of fairness in all its uh, situations. So what should the toolkit be used for? So only a very limited setting, um, which is uh, allocation problems or risk assessment problems, which have very well-defined protected attributes. Um, so not necessarily some of the, um, the work that might be on uh, text files, for example, but this would not be applicable for that. Um, and you would like to have some sort of statistical or mathematical notion of sameness among people or individuals or groups. And really, um, uh, this is only a starting point to a, a broader discussion among multiple stakeholders of uh, what really should be done in, in the overall problem that's been faced. Um, so just to briefly talk about the team. Uh, so who is it that uh, developed this thing? Um, so it was basically a, a summer project for us at IBM Research. Um, so after the New Europe's deadline, um, so June, July, and August is when we did this thing. Um, 
We had uh, several members of the IBM Research India Research Lab um, in Bangalore and in Delhi contribute, and then we had uh, folks from Yorktown Heights, New York, as well as some folks in uh, Cambridge, Massachusetts. Um, these are the names of everyone. Uh, we have very um, mixed backgrounds, so some people who are more um, uh, coming from a programming languages and software engineering background, some people uh, with a more of a machine learning or statistical civil processing background, and some with a computer interaction background. Um, as we were developing it, the code name uh, for the toolkit was Samya, which is a Sanskrit word uh, meaning sameness. And uh, uh, it really was a, I mean, really nice sort of project to be involved with. Uh, I think over my nine years at IBM, one of the most pleasurable uh, sort of things to do. Um, and we, uh, we're also interacting with the IBM product groups. So um, we have to justify uh, some of our efforts sometimes. Um, so uh, there's a new product by, from IBM called AI Open Scale, which uh, also came out in the fall um, around the September, October timeframe. And it includes some fairness metrics um, and uh, bias mitigation algorithm that the part of the so uh, this is, I mean, the open source is its own thing. Um, it has a lot more capabilities uh, that go uh, well beyond what is uh, in the open scale. Um, but uh, for industrial sort of users um, who really want something very um, uh, enterprise grade and so forth, it, it is open scale. Sorry? Use uh, yeah, so this AI open scale thing should work on really big, big data, yeah. But it doesn't have as many capabilities as, uh, as what's in the open source. Okay, um, so that was my talk. Um, so I'm going to turn it over to Sam now. Okay, um, so that was my uh, uh, maybe boring, maybe not boring uh, sort of intro. Okay, so the rest of it will be more fun, I think. Um, so just to go over the, the remainder of the agenda, um, so we'll have Rachel talk about uh, the interactive web experience, go through that in detail and show you everything that's there. Um, Mike will do a uh, first industry example on uh, finance sort of use case. Um, and we'll do an uh, interpretation of the metrics and guidance on what should be used when. Um, uh, and Karthi will um, spend some time making sure that uh, folks are uh, uh, doing the uh, installation okay. Um, we'll have the 30 minute break at that point uh, for, for the coffee and so forth, but uh, anyone who continues to have installation issues, we can address those uh, during that time. Uh, we'll come back, uh, then Mike will take you through um, how to take that first example and uh, modify it and change out um, different metrics and algorithms and so forth. Um, then uh, Rachel will uh, talk about guidance on choosing uh, different algorithms at, at different points. Um, Karthi will go through a very detailed uh, industry example related to medical expenditure. Um, this is actually something, uh, I won't steal the thunder, but I think it's probably the most comprehensive, uh, truly um, I mean, data science sort of flow you know, that involves fairness that I've seen uh, that's ever been put together. Um, Mike will talk about the explainers class and what we intend by that. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about uh, face image classification problems and we'll to that. And then uh, at the end, we'll uh, kind of discuss uh, any things, any questions, concerns about how you might want to contribute your own stuff. And uh, just to repeat, um, so uh, join the Slack community um, that is linked from the URL here at slash community. Uh, go to the channel FAT Tutorial 2019 and there's the installation guide and uh, files to download and uh, if you're comfortable enough to do it, uh, so start installing now, otherwise uh, we will have the installation section. And so I'll uh, pass it off on, uh, to Rachel. But Kush showed you already, I'll just show you here, that uh, the front page of the, the website uh, shows you all the different uh, metrics, algorithms uh, that uh, are available and gives you links to uh, various pieces of the toolkit. Um, we have this demo. Uh, so what this does is it provides a very basic introduction to the process that you go through of checking for bias and mitigating bias. And we have uh, provided uh, here um, you know, sample data sets 
that you can choose from. When we get to the uh, mitigation, the check, you can, you, uh, can choose from the metrics, just some of the metrics available. And then there's the mitigation stage, where you can choose an algorithm to mitigate. And then you get the results of showing you what uh, the, the, uh, what the model was like before uh, mitigation and after mitigation. So let's uh, go through. So the sample data sets, and these are also in the toolkit. Um, there, there are more in the toolkit, but uh, we have the Compass uh, data set that I'm sure you're all familiar with. Uh, we have the German credit scoring data set, and we have the adult census income uh, data set in this uh, demo. And um, I'm going to actually work uh, and show you uh, mitigate, mitigation on the adult census income data set. Uh, and this data set um, predicts whether income exceeds 50k per year uh, based on census data that was collected. And um, this learn more link uh, takes you to uh, out of the AIF 360 uh, website to the uh, website that describes that data set. So if you want to go and learn more about the data set, you can go here and do that. Um, so. What you see here uh, for adult census income is uh, you see uh, what protected attributes are defined for this data set. So um, there's the uh, race and sex are our protected attributes. And then you see uh, when Kush was going through the glossary, he talked about you know you have to have the protected attributes, then you have to define uh, for that protected attribute what's the privilege group and what's the unprivileged group. Uh, so here we see that for adult census income, race is a protected attribute with uh, white being privileged, non-white being unprivileged, and the second protected attribute, sex, with male being privileged and female being unprivileged. So we're going to work with this data set, so we select it, and then we're going to go to the next phase of the process. So now we're checking for bias. And so here we see that uh, we're checking for bias on our data set, but there's no mitigation yet. So this is just the base uh, data. And uh, what we see is uh, we've chosen uh, five of the bias metrics to illustrate. And we can see that for the privilege group of race, um, that uh, for these different metrics, some are biased, shown here with red, some are unbiased on these different metrics. If we, we can also see the accuracy, because often you're trading off um, accuracy against um, uh, having a, a model that's unbiased. Um, so the other thing is uh, we set uh, thresholds on what is, uh, you know, what counts as bias and what doesn't count as bias, which also touched on that, the disparate impact, uh, the four-fifths rule. Um, so we have set thresholds and we show them here that, um, you know, for statistical parity difference, um, basically you're, you are fair at zero, uh, but you're, you're biased if you're between, you know, um, uh, zero and uh, point, uh, I think point one over here. Um, so then, um, going down to the protected attribute sex, uh, where we have our privilege group male and our unprivileged group female. Um, again, we show the accuracy, same accuracy, and we have our um, default threshold. And here we see that uh, bias against the unprivileged group is detected in four out of five of our metrics. So we have these four metrics uh, where we're detecting bias, and you'll see that there. Um, so this is our original data set. Yes? I want to make sure I understand what we're doing here. Is there some model that has been pre-trained here when we say it's biased against women, for example, that women are in reality making more money than this model is predicting the making? Yes. So we trained we trained a model and now we're checking um, we're checking for uh, the fairness there. But next what we're going to do is we're going to do a mitigation. So so here, on the next step, we've done our check and now we're mitigating. So we found bias um, and now we're mitigating. And we can mitigate at various points in time. 
So um, we can uh, we can choose a reweigh algorithm. And what these pictures here show you, uh, this reweighing algorithm would be mitigating uh, on the data set. Um, so whereas the optimized pre-processing algorithm also mitigates at the data set, whereas adversarial debiasing actually trains an unfair classifier here, so you, you're mitigating at the classification, so when you're doing the modeling or training a model, and then um, you have the reject option based classification, which actually is post processing. So that's, um, you know, that's uh, another mitigation you can choose. Uh, so, and, uh, and in, the, um, in uh, the website, if you go to learn more about how to choose, there is guidance. We're going to come back to this uh, later, uh, this, uh, after the break. And uh, talk about that. So let's go back here. And um, we are now going to. So we found bias, and what we're going to do now is we're going to choose our our debiasing uh, or uh, our mitigation method, and we're going to choose uh, to choose adversarial debiasing. For now, you can play with it and choose some of the others. And uh, this, this method learns a classifier that maximizes prediction accuracy and simultaneously reduces an adversary's ability to determine the protected attribute from the predictions. So this approach leads to a fair classifier, as I said. You're, you're, you're uh, training a, a fair classifier. Um, so this approach leads to a fair classifier as the predictions cannot carry any, any group discrimination information that the advisory can exploit. Adversary, sorry, <laughs> can exploit. Um, so, okay, so let me, so we, we chose our data set, we did our check for, for bias uh, on, on the initial uh, um, model. Now we're actually doing a, a mitigation, so let's, let's mitigate. So here we are, we've mitigated, and um, so we have this. So that we see that um, for adult census income data set, we've mitigated using adversarial bias and algorithm. And then you get to see that actually the accuracy has changed. So um, so when we train this classifier, it's a fairer classifier because we can see that we've got rid of bias here. It's indicated in our various metrics that we've actually no longer have bias, but our accuracy has also dropped. So um, it changed from 82% to 70%. So there's a you know decision to be made about that trade-off between you've got a fairer model but you've got um, a less accurate uh, model. Now, not that doesn't always happen. I mean, it depends very much on your particular uh, data set. Uh, so anyway, that's um, sort of taking you through. You can play with the demo, then you can uh, you know explore what's there. Yeah. And you only mitigate for one vector attribute at a time? So, um, yeah, you basically, we're mitigating for both. We're mitigating for um, protected attribute race and protected attribute sets. It looks like you're doing different models for each. So, for the So, I think, should we leave it there for the demo? And then, any other questions? At this point, Mike's going to now go through a code example. So we're following the same process, but you'll see it with the actual uh, Python code. So, um, So just to make sure everyone's oriented, um, the web demo is a way to sort of easily get into the toolkit and understand its functionality. 
what we expect people to do is actually use the toolkit, download the toolkit like you'll be doing shortly, and write Python code against the interface. Okay, so if you're confused about you know, where, does the, where does the web aspect come in, do I have to write widgets and things like that? No, you don't. It's just a way to both understand the concepts of what we're talking about, um, and also to, to demonstrate what the, the functionality would actually have, out, act, without actually have to go into code, which I'm about to do now. So as Rachel said, the, uh, you saw a subset of the functionality in the web demo, and in the code, many tutorials you're about to see, you'll see the fuller functionality. So going back to our, the main page here, um, there's a, a bunch of different resources here that Chris mentioned early on. Uh, one of them is what we call tutorials, right? And there'll be three of them I'm going to go through in a second. The one I'm going to show you would be called the Hello World uh, tutorial um, in programming languages. When you learn a new language, they say, okay, show me how to print Hello World. That's the very basic kick the tires kind of thing. That's the spirit of this. Um, in addition to these tutorials that you'll see, there are also notebooks. And the tutorials are notebooks themselves, but they're notebooks that give you even more examples. So there's plenty of examples to dive in. And what we're going to do is I'm going to show you, walk you through a very simple Hello World one, and then later uh, I'm going to ask you to actually change it. So if you've, you know, if you've taken a, a programming course, you know it's one thing to have the instructor say, here's how it works, watch, and then asking you to go change it and compile and make it run. It's a very different thing. It's a more satisfying when you can do it yourself. So that's coming up. So if you click on tutorials, you'll see we have these three tutorials which we're going to go through in this session. And this credit scoring one is the, the Hello World one. It's using a public data set, the German credit data set. Um, and we're going to try to detect and mitigate, uh, mitigate age bias. So, so sort of the subset of what Rachel just showed. So uh, when you click on that link, you go into our repository, uh, and it's viewed as a notebook, a Jupyter notebook, if you're familiar with that. Um, and if you're not familiar with a notebook, uh, basically it's a nice way of having text, like a web page, but also uh, pictures, but most importantly, code. Okay. So this is sort of a self-documenting uh, way of walking you through uh, how, to, how to work with um, Fairness 360. So I'm not going to read all the words here. Um, uh, it's a lot of the stuff Kush has already covered and, and Rachel has covered, and you can read that uh, when you get a chance. Um, but, um, and yeah, these concepts are ready to What I want to go through is the steps of, I want to use Fairness 360, how do I just get started, okay? So the goal of this tutorial is to do some very simple things. It's first to compute a metric on some data set, like Rachel did, the very first thing to see if there is bias in the data set. Okay? Is it, so remember, a data set has a bunch of features and then it has an outcome, typically a yes or no or positive or negative kind of thing for a binary uh, uh, label. Um, and so we're going to look at that data set and say, is it biased on, on some, uh, some attribute? Is there some bias there? So we'll compute a metric for that. Um, and then we will, like Rachel did before, we'll mitigate it with one of the algorithms, try to fix the, the bias and then compute the metric again to see if we fixed it. So it's a sort of a subset of what Rachel did, but now we're actually doing it in code. And so the, there are these five steps. So the first step is a typical uh, programming language thing, is you've got to do some stuff before you get to the exciting part, uh, a bunch of import statements to make sure you get the right kind of packages. Right? Um, so these are things here, we're going to use the German data set, we're going to use this particular uh, class of metrics, and we're going to use this, uh, re this uh, mitigation algorithm. Okay. Uh, step two, and again, there's words here that's t saying what I'm saying. Step two is we're going to load the data set, and we're going to specify the, uh, the protected attribute that we're going to be looking at. So uh, as I'm sure probably everyone knows here, uh, these toolkits aren't a magic thing where you just give it a data set and you say, find bias. You have to say, what are you looking at? Which field are you concerned about in terms of, uh, of bias, and, and which is the privileged class and the unprivileged? So here, that's what we're doing. We're saying, look at the field in this particular data set called age, uh, and that's the one we care about. We're sensitive to age, we want to make sure, we want to determine what kind of bias there is. And age, as you know, is not a binary value, so here we have to say, okay, let's cut it off at above 25 and below 25. Just an example. Um, and then, like uh, most machine learning, we, we take, our, take that data set and we split it between the training set and the test set. Here it's 75, 70 percent training, 30 uh, percent test. And then we're just defining some variables here. This, if you're not familiar with Python, this is just defining some variables. Uh, the privilege group is going to be, for the age attribute, one is privileged and zero is unprivileged. It's not a big deal. Okay, and then now we get to the exciting part, sorry. 
Um, so now we've got it set up and we're ready to actually compute the metric. Right? So now we're going to apply some statistics to compute a metric uh, and we pass in those parameters, the, the unprivileged group and the privileged group and the training data set. And then we've got to do some, we're going to print out, and the exciting part here is this right here, this method. Right? So we're taking the train data set and we're calling this method, this function, that's going to compute the mean difference. It's going to give you a value, uh, 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 some kind of a value of how much bias there is. Um, and what it comes out to be is negative about 17%. And what that means is the outcomes for the unprivileged group are worse by about 17%. So there's some level of bias here. Uh, is 17% a, a lot, a little? It really depends on, like Kush said before, depends on what you're doing and what the laws are, what your business um, business case is, and, and how much you know how much tolerance you have for some for the for some level of bias. So a very important decision you made there. Okay, so in this particular case, we decide 17% is not uh, not satisfying. Uh, we want to reduce that. So now we're going to try to mitigate. Uh, the bias. And this particular algorithm is the uh, reweighing algorithm. So here we're creating a reweighing object, passing in parameters, uh, and then we're using the fit transform method. Okay. So the nice thing is, if you look at the paper for this, this algorithm, there's a bunch of math and manipulation going on. This is all done behind the scenes, um, and we just call the function, just like the site here. Of course, the, the, uh, the actual code is available in, in the GitHub repository if you want to go and look at it uh, if you're a researcher. So that's it, that transformed, and now the last step is we're going to say, all right, let's compute the same metric and see the after picture. We did the before picture, now the after picture. This is similar to what Rachel showed uh, quickly on those, those uh, bar charts. So we're gonna do the same, uh, same call here, but now we're looking at the transformed data set. The other parameters are the same. And we're gonna print out again the mean difference on the transformed data set. Uh, and lo and behold, it comes out to be 0% uh, no bias. So this is a, a, nice, a nice example. That's basically it. Um, any questions on this? What we're gonna do later on is I'm gonna ask you to go and change some code. Try it. So, yes, please. Uh, when you're running this uh, notebook, the only requirement was the IM360 library? Yes, yes. The, the uh, AIF360 itself requires some things, but if you do a pip install of that, okay. then you better. The installation guide has Yeah, the, the point is we didn't want to be distributing all these data sets because they should get it from that source. Um, so, so there's an easy way, like you said, in the installation guide to get it for this tutorial. Yes? Can you describe a little bit like the output of the reweighing algorithm and how that might interact with like the screen normalization steps? What do you mean by the output? Mm -hmm. So is the, re the reweighing output is like a, another data set or is it like a uh, way store? Yeah, so the relay, so the data set runs the train. Um, that's actually a, a data set object, uh, an AR360 data, data set object. And the AR360 data set object has my two fields. One of that is instant rates. So to begin with, it will be all ones. And then this algorithm will go and modify that. And uh, um, some of the other algorithms we will implement will actually use the relay data so that you know, Yes. Uh, so in the left demo we saw accuracy. Is it easy to grab the accuracy here too? Um, yeah, it is possible. I mean, um, further tutorials they will have. I mean, this is just a starting tutorial. Uh, so the further tutorials will actually show that you know we can actually compute the accuracy. Yes. Uh, it is a mitigation hypothesis require change. So this mitigation algorithm require tuning. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So um, on the this is a this is one of the algorithms that requires no hyperparameters. But there are 
most of the algorithms, I would say, require some yeah. sort of type of analysis, and it's, it's important to tune this up. Because I think in the notebook, um, the, you know, the uh, performance at the end is based on training data. I was wondering how the performance would be like to test. Yeah, yeah. So if yeah. you apply it on test, then uh, it won't be zero. It will be slightly more than zero. But hopefully, um, it will be less than what we started with. Yeah, so uh, we've seen this in practice, um, and we do know that there's 21 or more um, definitions of fairness. So uh, what should be what should we be using in you know, the situation in terms of the metrics? Okay, um, so this is a screenshot from last year's Fatstar conference. So that is uh, Arvind Narayan and, and uh, he is talking about the 21 definitions. So there really is uh, a definition dilemma and uh, there is a lot of uh, confusion, matrix confusion as well. Um, so uh, if you haven't seen this, this is from Wikipedia and um, there's so many different uh, types of ways you can compute errors for um, uh, even just for binary classification problems here. Um, and uh, there's also this uh, bewilderment uh, related to the world view that a person might or might not have. Uh, so this is a really nice paper um, that uh, talks about uh, I mean, these different sort of conceptions of uh, where it is that um, uh, you're thinking about uh, does the, uh, do the observed features really reflect um, uh, the innate abilities of, uh, of individuals and so forth. Yeah. Um, so, as you're thinking about the different metrics uh, that we have, or in general, I mean, not specific to the toolkit, uh, but uh, you first have to think about, I mean, do I care about individual fairness, group fairness, or both? Um, this is, uh, I mean, what I'm going to kind of talk about is more of, if you've thought about it, what, how that it, I mean, affects your choices among the, uh, the metrics. but. Um, uh, really, all of these things are more about, as a subject matter expert, as a, a policymaker, what is it that you really care about? So if you do care about individual fairness, uh, uh, we do have the consistency measure, which is uh, probably the one that you would want to go with. Um, if you do care about group fairness, um, most of the metrics are related to that, so that includes um, the, the positive rate difference and so forth. And, um, if you care about both and want a single number reflecting it, uh, as I mentioned before, uh, things like the generalized entropy index or the way to go. Um, so what, I, what I'm showing on the screen are actually the, uh, the, uh, the API for the toolkit. So uh, we see the actual mathematical definition of these things, um, what sort of inputs that you need, um, and, and so forth. So, uh, just as an initial starting point, you do have to consider uh, what your goals are. Is it uh, group or individual and, and so forth? And do you even have uh, predicted attributes by which you can define groups or not? So once you've um, decided that uh, uh, what sort of fairness metric you're looking about group or individual, um, you also need to figure out um, are you caring about a classification metric or a data set metric? So on the training data or on the learned model slash uh, predictions. So um, again, this kind of relates to which sort of bias mitigation you'll be doing. Um, so if you're going to be doing pre-processing, you're likely um, going to, I mean, the only thing you can really do is uh, look at uh, the data set metrics. So these are the disparate impact or statistical parity difference sort of things. Um, and once you have a learned model um, and more often than not, you're either going to be doing um, uh, the in-processing or post-processing, but even with the pre-processing, uh, you often care about what happens downstream uh, because uh, the training data could be modified but not do anything. So, and you would want to look at classification metrics. So these metrics involve um, actually two inputs. So there's a data set and a classified data set, whereas um, in the data set metrics, uh, there's a single data set. So, um, so you can't use any of the confusion matrix sort of stuff uh, over here. 
Um, so now coming to this worldview uh, sort of stuff. So here's the archive link. Um, uh, uh, so basically, um, what uh, this paper talks about is that um, there's uh, two extremes of worldviews that one can hold. Um, so what you see is what you get, and we're all equal. And this is copied uh, directly from the paper. Um, um, so I'm not going to read it aloud uh, as is, but um, these are two examples, both uh, college admissions. In the first, we say that um, uh, things like the SAT scores and GPAs and other sort of observable features uh, correlate well with the applicant's ability. Um, and in the second case, uh, there might be some uh, structural bias in, in these measurements, so it's not a true reflection of what's going on. So um, in the second one, we're all equal. What you really want is uh, groups to have uh, equal selection rates, uh, regardless of um, uh, what their feature distributions might uh, otherwise say. And in those cases, you want to use things like disparate impact or statistical parity difference. Um, for the, the first kind of what you see is what you get, um, that's where you want more of the, uh, the accuracy measures of cross groups to be the same, and uh, things like average odds to be uh, the choices they get. Um, so those are the two extremes, the average odds difference and the uh, statistical parity difference. There's things in between as well. This is a figure from the Equitas, both in the University of Chicago. Um, so they kind of go through and talk about how um, uh, the extreme uh, on this side of the demographic statistical parity difference is there, but then uh, uh, sort of relaxations or things in between um, the quality of uh, odds and uh, the statistical parity are things like uh, false discovery rate parity or false emission rate parity and so forth. So uh, you can kind of work your way through uh, these sort of questions as well. Um, and then finally, um, uh, we have both versions of most of these metrics. Um, we have ratios as well as differences for a lot of the, uh, the group fairness metrics. Um, so the choice among that it conveys more or less the same information. I mean, you take two numbers, you can take their ratio or you can take their difference. Um, uh, but for humans uh, who are consuming this, uh, it's often the case that um, one or the other uh, is better suited to, to that user group. So um, whatever is, uh, works well would, would be better. And um, actually at AIS um, a couple of days ago, there was a paper which um, uh, looked at uh, stability um, when you have uh, differences or ratios. Um, and it turns out that um, from a statistical uh, perspective, differences are more stable than ratios, which kind of makes sense because you can have more extreme values when you uh, are dividing two things. Um, so there might be some statistical reasons to go with that. Um, so that's kind of uh, a brief tour of uh, how you might go through thinking through uh, which sort of metrics are applicable for your problems. But uh, again, this is very much an open area which needs better uh, sort of tools and, and so forth. It's something that we're actively working on as well. But um, I'd encourage uh, many of you to, to think about that problem. Uh, any questions about this section? Yeah. Yeah, uh, I think that's very possible, especially given that there's so many um, things to, to try out here. Uh, this relates to the provenance question in some sense. If you are able to capture um, for auditing purposes or whatever, that uh, what were all the analysis steps that you actually undertook, then uh, you can correct for them and kind of uh, illuminate the fact that uh, you were doing that. But um, yeah, it, it is a danger. It's very much a danger, I would say. Yeah, we might touch on this later on, but uh, in some of the examples that you use, you have sort of two classes. One is underrepresented or uh, favorable, and the other one is uh, unfavored. What if you have three classes? So one is favored, and the other two are unfavored at different degrees. Can some of the tools account for that? Uh, yeah, so privileged and unprivileged is the term we're using. So um, uh, 
Uh, in the capabilities that we have right now, um, we can have multiple groups. Um, there's no restriction on that, but we have to categorize uh, each of the groups into either privileged or unprivileged. Um, so that is some future work that would be interesting to pursue. I don't know if there's any well-defined uh, metrics in the literature that actually have gradations of uh, how, uh, how privileged uh, different groups are, but it might be a, a nice paper for this conference next year. Other questions? Okay, um, so I'll invite Karthi up and uh, he can take you through um, the installation guide and, and so forth. And uh, please, uh, again, just remind you, we have folks uh, in Yorktown Heights right now on Slack to answer questions in addition to the folks that we have here. Right? Thanks, Kush. So um, the installation guide is available in the Slack channel. So that's the first thing um, you have to download and we can go through it. So uh, it's there in Fat Tutorial 2019 installation guide that we I already downloaded it and kept everything here. Um, so I'll just open it up. Yeah, so um, basically it starts with um, a bunch of links, uh, tutorial website and all that. And I mean, this is all for future reference for you guys, but uh, we can start right here, right? So um, like, uh, I think some of, some people are asking like, I have only Python 2, how do I install this and all that. So uh, the recommended way is to use like Python 3, Anaconda. Um, but if you have Python 2, Ideally, AF360 will work for both Python 2 and 3. We have tested it and it should work for both. Um, but there may be some packages that will have trouble installing. So um, so those things are something you need to keep in mind. So in this session, I'll just go through the typical installation process, which is Python 3 using Anaconda. Um, but if you want to try something else, um, you are very welcome to try that. And if you have any difficulties, you will try our best to help you. So, um, let me also open a shell, just to make sure. And I'll keep it here, and make it bigger. Okay. Okay, so now um, the first thing to check is if you have Anaconda installed, right? So type Python, and uh, it says Anaconda here. So it means that it is Anaconda installation. In case you are wondering whether you have Anaconda or not. Right? So if it says Anaconda there, it's, uh, it's an Anaconda installation. If not, um, you can always download it. You can go to anaconda.com slash download. Um, I don't recommend you trying it right now because the internet is particularly slow. Uh, so but um, it's a future reference, right? So you can always download it. Uh, it's a little bit less painful so to do this. Um, so, assuming that we have Anaconda, um, I'm going to go through the typical installation steps. So the first thing to do is uh, create an environment. So I'm going to create an environment called AF360 underscore tutorial, UT. And I'm going to specifically install Python 3.5.6 in this environment because we know that it works well. And also, please note that I'm doing this on a Mac. Uh, if you're doing it on Windows, uh, you may want to open a separate Anaconda prompt, which is available when you actually install Anaconda. If you go to the Anaconda, um, if you drop down menu, you will actually see the Anaconda prompt. So that's where you have to get this one. So I'm going to install this thing. So it should take, it should be quick, hopefully. Um, but the thing is, it will download a lot of stuff. So again, uh, if you have already not done this, it might be slow for you right now. Like for example, it did it very quickly for me because 
most of the packages were cached. I had this installed before. So otherwise, it might take a bit of time. So once you do that, uh, you uh, activate that environment. The reason why we are not doing it you know, globally is that, um, again, all Python packages have lots of dependencies. So it's always better to create a virtual environment and uh, install it. So um, you can see that I have activated the AF360 environment. And I, my prompt actually changed here to AF360. So it means that I'm in this environment, right? So once I have it, then um, I just do pip install, right? So I just do pip install AF360. This is the package. So I just created the environment. It doesn't mean that I have the package. I have to actually install it. So uh, I'm going to install the package here. So again, you can see that most of my files are cached. So it's going to be really, really fast. But uh, if you try it, it might be slow. So uh, because of all the downloads. Right, so uh, yeah, so the, the AF360 package is now installed. So just to verify it, we go ahead, we type Python and say import AF360. So you can see that there are no errors. And if you want more confirmation that you have the latest package, you do AF360 version. And it says 2.0, which is the latest version, uh, released like four days back. So uh, we have AIF360, but that's not all. Like I said, um, AIF360 does not come with the data sets. Uh, so you actually have to download them from, uh, from the respective websites and uh, place them in the right place. Um, so um, that's something you have to uh, end up doing if you are actually installing it. Uh, but then here for the convenience of uh, users, uh, we have that in the uh, Slack channel again. So it is there in this tutorial files.zip. So if you are able to download it, uh, this tutorial files.zip, um, like here, it will actually contain a data folder, which contains all the four data sets that we will use. So, and it has the raw data, right? So now the question is to copy this over to the right place, right? So for that, we give you the script called copy data sets. So if you just execute that script, so, um, let me actually go to that this this folder, the tutorial files folder. So you change over to that directory, right? And uh, you have this copy datasets.py script. So you just say Python copy datasets. So now all the datasets are copied. Uh, so this can be a little bit non-trivial, mainly because. Uh, Python installs these they, uh, the the package in a very uh, strange place, I would say. So, uh, in order for you to detect it and do it, it might take a bit of time. But we have this convenience group that can do it for you. Okay. So now all the pack, uh, data sets are copied to the right place, right? So now let's see what the next step is. So um, and we are also saying that by doing this for this purpose of the tutorial, you are agreeing to the uh, um, copyright and all the other conditions that are listed in the data set. That's implicit if you're doing this stuff. Then, um, if you want to actually run the notebooks yourself, right? If you don't want to follow along, if you want to run the notebooks yourself, you have to actually download the notebooks because the notebooks are not part of the package, right? So the core package contains only the core code. It doesn't contain the notebooks. And, uh, but there is a link here that shows where the, uh, uh, notebooks are. So I'll go there. I'll just show you how to do that, right? So go to the master branch and uh, just say download the master branch, right? So if you just download the entire AF360, uh, it, it will download. But you can see that it's there right there in the first page, right? So uh, so you should actually download it much faster. Um, so the examples are there in this folder, right? right here. So you just take this and copy it wherever you have, uh, wherever you want actually. So I'm going to copy it here. I have it already, but I'm just going to re it. So, uh, so you can see that all the examples are there. Right. So this now contains all the notebooks. So now you have 
AF316 style, as well as all the, you have all the notebooks and you have the data sets. Um, so there is only, uh, there are a few things that need to happen again. Um, so, um, but this is like a good starting point for um, at least two of the three tutorials that we will do. Um, the other thing you have to do, which could take again a bit of time given the internet connection, is that you have to download this phase data set because there is a general classification tutorial and uh, that tutorial depends on this phase data set. And uh, it's the UTK phase data set and you can, you can again download it uh, from the internet. <coughs> I'm not going to do it right now because it's under the So, not going to do it. Okay. so um, then, um, so this 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 helps you like get to the stage where you can actually run the core functionality in AF360. Uh, but if you want to run all the notebooks, you have to also install like additional packages, and it's also a very easy step. So you just have to do like two things. One is like you have to upgrade your NumPy because of some strange this is the latest version of uh, uh, NumPy. So you have to upgrade your NumPy just to make sure, and then you have to install additional packages that are given in uh, the requirements.txt file. Right? So if you go to tutorial files, you have this requirements.txt file, which has the additional packages. You have to install them. So I'm going to do that also right now, and it's a very easy step. Before you do that, you have a there. Yeah, so um, yeah, this won't affect anything. Just that we have to change the AF360 uh, thing uh, to accept higher versions of it. We had disallowed it because of some reasons, uh, but it won't affect anything that you are running. But good idea. <laughs> uh, so yeah, just install this uh, additional requirements. Again, this is very fast for me, but it could be quite <coughs> useful for you folks. So, uh, Linux had a problem tested because the orange tree package shouldn't be compiled because of the black object. Black holes out in the package. And if we have the same problem, yeah. So um, yeah, I mean, I can expect all sorts of strange things. Uh, to be honest, I tried this these things like for like 40, 50 times in various different machines. So uh, I can understand your pain. And uh, there is all sorts of strangeness that can happen because of the, all the interactions. It's not just, I, I don't think it's just an AF360 problem, I think it's just the Python dependency uh, issues, right? So my favorite solution is to just comment that out in the requirements and not, and live with the fact that you won't be able to run that in that particular environment, right? So uh, that's, otherwise you have to test a lot of things there. You won't be able to get anywhere. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, also for the gender classification tutorial, uh, we need PyTorch because it's going to train a, a model, a PyTorch model. So, uh, and this, this one is still installed. So, we have to install PyTorch and uh, Torch summary. Right? So, these are two things that need to happen. We'll take like uh, probably a minute. Okay, so um, some people, by the time it's happening, so I also I also wanted to mention that there are some instructions here that show how to do this with pure Python without Anaconda. Um, sometimes it works. Uh, it really depends on the machine. So, like I said again, it's it's a common problem with Python. So. I think anybody who, who is doing Python programming can see this. Um, so yeah, but there is instructions here, uh, which are somewhat helpful. And the other thing is, uh, there is this other package called CVXPy, which is required when you want to run a particular uh, thing called optimized pre-crossing, particular debiasing algorithm. Uh, but installing it in Windows um, will take time. And you cannot do it right now because it has to download a lot of things. Uh, and installing it in Linux and Mac is somewhat more easier. You just have to do this install. 
But if you want to install it in Windows, you have to first download the Visual C++ distributor and do all that. So uh, you can try it as a homework problem. Can you say again what does it do? It's used in this uh, debiasing algorithm called Optimized Preprocessing. It's okay. a convex optimization solver. So um, we use that to implement our algorithm. So um, and installing it in Windows is going to take time. Purely from an installation, but otherwise it runs fine. It's like a good package. Just that installation will take time. So uh, yeah, I mean, so this is done. So um, let me just say that we can install PyTorch. Um, hopefully, very easy and. Uh, also, yeah. We are almost out of time, but uh, I'm going to be here if anyone has questions or information. So I'd be right here. But yeah, I think we are almost there. So we, we are set for running, you know, things are